Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next talk for Hope 2020. Uh, I hope you are enjoying yourself, and I hope you've been watching lots of Hope Talks. We have next up Alexis Hancock, who is from the EFF. She is the lead developer currently for HTTPS Everywhere, uh, and she's been doing web and system admin work for uh, the better part of 10 years now since she graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology at RIT. Uh, and she's here to talk to us today about mobile first. So with no further ado, Alexis, thank you very much for coming and over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk today. I am Alexis Hancock and I am a staff technologist at the EFF. Sorry about the jump around there. And Today I'm talking about digital identities and your privacy. Just went over my title at EFF. I've been at EFF for about two years almost now, and I am the lead developer on HTTPS Everywhere web extension project. And it's a tool that helps encrypt your web traffic online and are offered in the most major browsers. And I definitely encourage you to download it and definitely encourage open source contribution to it. My other titles are also educator, activist for close to 10 years now. And I have been mainly working in the space of helping others get their tech together essentially when it comes to doing their work, educating others, or when they want to go organize in some sort of way. Uh, with this project at EFF, I have done quite a bit of research when it comes to digital identity in particular and people's privacy when they're online um, with different technologies, with what that looks like and how does that get implemented in the world rather than just looking at data in transit, what does that look like where someone is being able to actually obtain something and go forth safely and security in, insecurely in all modes. So I usually go down a lot of rabbit holes when um, I'm talking about this really broad, vague discussion of internet and privacy. And so the rabbit hole I'm taking you down today is something called self-sovereign identity. Uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about what that means exactly, um, the technologies that are involved with that, particularly with standards bodies like the W3C the World Wide Web Consortium, which if you're not familiar with, they also have like a, an entire organization dedicated to web standards. So that's what the W3C is and the International Standards Organization and a few other examples that I'll give to you today around the implications of privacy concerns that we have with EFF and that I have and further discussion around disparities around the digital first conversation and what that what SSI can look like in the future, especially with marginalized communities, um, compromised threat models, etc. So different parts of identity, you ask different people what identity is and what their identity is, you'll likely get different answers. Um, I have very like common concepts of what a person's identity may entail here definitely doesn't encompass everything of what someone considers their identity. A lot of this is around like production in society. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, identity is much more than this, obviously. But some of the things you may have is certifications, degrees, government issue IDs and numbers, of course, would be a very um, authoritative, authoritative stance in your identity as a person, as a citizen, emails. And email is very important because you sign up for a lot of online accounts via email. Um, there's other ways to sign for online accounts now with like single sign on through like maybe Google profiles or Facebook profiles, some sort of authentication that way. But generally the standard way to sign up for something is through email. So your email may be tied to many sorts of identities that you may have online. Uh, in different groups and different services. Uh, you may have publications, you may have blogs, you may have academic research, you may have just, you know, whatever forms that you may be involved with, with commentary. That could look like different things. 
your job. A lot of people tie in their job to their identity, or they may not, but it's definitely a part of who they are in the day-to-day function. You may have some awards out there that you may consider a part of your identity. And much, much more. Hobbies, uh, whatever activities you may be into, these are the things that go forth and form and shape who you are. And that also considers your past and what your future ideals are and your principles. But I'm talking about more tangible things, of course, as you can see uh, with the examples that I've given here. Um, The concept of the self-sovereign identity is something that's been in development since the early 2000s, especially when people have been considering what does identity look like online? So self-sovereign identity has claims over one's identity The you know, their, the data pertaining to one's identity is controlled by you and without having to go through the intermediary party or a centralized authority to verify who you are in different scenarios. So at its core, theoretically, Identity credentials should be asynchronous, decentralized, and portable. So these go against the principles of centralized authority and identity we may have with like mobile driver's licenses or sorry, driver's licenses um, in particular, or, you know, presenting any other sort of form of identification like social security numbers, like those things are generally portable by, you know, paper, card, or whatever material that it's made of, but the sense of being able to verify who you are you usually have to go through a process to do that, um, depending on the part of the process you're in, maybe with your health data or having to get a referral or having to renew your license, things of that nature. So one of the models I wanted to talk to you about is the W3C Verify Credentials Data Model. So This is not in itself a a technology. This is a data model that mentions many technologies. And a verifiable credential has been defined to be just a claim that is trusted between issuer, holder, and a verifier. And you can read more on that specification. But the model that gets displayed here is something called like the issuer holder verifier trust model that's not really a fancy name or term for it i believe but the trust model you'll see here with the holder an issued document from the issuer they have right privileges to the verifiable data registry and the verifier will have read privileges and the holder will be able to present a immutable piece of identification um, digitally to the verifier. So this is what the trust model will look like in its most bird's eye view form. A part of a verified credential is something called decentralized identifiers. So decentralized identifiers or DID is also in working draft with the W3C and it's a portable URL based identifier, also known as DID, like I said, with associated with an entity in particular. And it's really important to highlight the context and the ID of where the DID is referenced. And this is a decentralized piece that you're alleged to be able to be portable from repository or repository to verifier or another verifier without linking personal identifiable information with these multiple verifications in different places with your DID. You should be able to express uh, some sort of authentication of who you are um, with that DID. That's the concept around this. And involved with that would be something called JSON-LD. So there's other types of specifications and technologies that talk about linked data sets and what that can look like within a decentralized identifier document or DID. But right now we're just going to focus on one of the major ones, which is uh, JSON linked data. And linked data is a concept that um, programmatically has been discussed for a while. Um, There's a video here explaining JSON LD, but the irony is not lost on me that I was about to play a video within a video and I won't put you through that. So 
built with this um, in mind was RESTful services. A lot of RESTful services follow JSON object notation. So does um, data interoperability and in, in structured databases. So unstructured beta ba databases will look like things like MongoDB, CouchDB, those types of databases in juxtaposition to the more traditional databases like SQL. So you'll see highlighted here context and ID and context and ID are very important in pieces. And I would say the most important pieces when talking about a JSON LD set. And this gets incorporated into the DID document. So you'll see context and ID there. So those two things are very important. And this would qualify as a JSON linked data set. And being able to use some sort of authentication, you'll see some service here that's in context and um, public key infrastructure um, sets here that are linked here within the, the data set itself in the document. So another piece of technology that is, gets discussed often is something called a uh, blockchain, if you haven't heard of it, but peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledgers is the, the main concept of blockchains, right? So our blockchain-based technology. And you'll hear blockchain get brought up in talking about decentralized identification measures where they're talking about necessarily actually the storage of the decentralized identifier in particular and storage in a distributed ledger. So having something that's immutable, um, easily tracked through a party that, you know, that's allegedly decentralized and being able to not have to go through a centralized authority to gain such and to access such. So that's usually where blockchain comes in when we're discussing these things. And, and it's not a requirement. So the specifications that we discuss, like verified credentials, they discuss that blockchain is not required, but they do mention that it is a possible implementation for a data registry. And so going into another standards body, talking about the International Standards Organization here and the Mobile's Driver's License Application, or MDL for short. And here you'll see that the MDL interface will mimic the same trust model that we saw earlier with the verified credentials. You'll see an issuing authority, a mobile driver's license holder, and a MDL reader. And that'll be presented by whoever the verifying party is. So in this case, this makes the technologies that we mentioned earlier um, a little different because this explicitly states something that's on your mobile device. Whereas the previous technology we talked about doesn't necessarily explicitly say uh, your phone or your tablet, but you would generally consider that's how these technologies would get ported, even though they discuss in a more broader range as in like using it in web applications. This in particular is a narrows the scenario down to using it to your phone. And this is very much so bird's eye view of what could happen in terms of being able to exchange a document or your phone instead to verify who you are to an authority that asks for something like a driver's license, which you would think the, the, the first scenario would pop in your head would be law enforcement. This uh, particular st standard talks about examples where you know, you have to give over a documentation or a piece of paper or whatever the, the material is for a driver's license. You, you would have to actually physically hand it over and it would list all the information that you would normally have um, to the party. And it may be a little bit of oversharing. So you may not want to share your address with the party that's asking for your state ID, but you have to hand over the whole document. This was presented as a means of actually alleviating that and not necessarily having to hand over all information on your driver's license, in particular, or your ID 
in one setting, but just having to having the choice of which pieces of information you want to give over that are relevant. So, of course, I'm skipping over with um, MDL at the moment, the concerns that surround that, because you can get into situations where it be maybe a hostile mis mismatch with law enforcement, where they ask for um, more information than you're willing to give, what happens in those scenarios. Um, so MDL specification in particular um, talks about, you know, a lot of things like cipher suites, um, but what all specifications um, that I discuss go over the, the security concepts that they would use and the types of session encryptions that they would use. But um, actually before I get into the privacy concerns in particular, I did want to share with you some documentation here around what that data exchange could look like with a mobile driver's license. So once activated, you'll see it's activated through something maybe like NFC or barcode. And you'll see that transfer device engagement um, would occur and a very cyclical relationship between the tokenized data set that or the token authentication that would have with a, a, a mobile driver's license reader. So when the MDL reader asks for this, this could happen a number of ways, NFC, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi aware, a web API or a web application particularly, or OpenID Connect or OIDC. And this is a token set. So you would say that the token would send the, the needed authorization to be able to verify um, the person holding the mobile driver's license with the verifying authority. So this, I tried to make the black and white graphic from the spec look a little bit more interesting, but either way, this is the graph that they had for the data exchange in particular. So data retrieval will look a little different in setting where they talk about that session encryption piece and they talk about what they use and what type of hardware modules you would need in order to actually store this type of information on your phone correctly and what type of specifications that the verify would need. So let me go back to discussing privacy concerns. And here I talk about what that looks like when you have discussing these digitized identities. And in a lot of discussions I've had, a lot of low risk situations get, you know, explained like, you know, verifying you for 21 to a bouncer rather than giving your whole information set from a driver's license. But I've seen in the wild, very risky, um, concerning scenarios talking about different sorts of ways verify credentials get implemented. In particular, with COVID-19 pandemic that's currently happening with immunity passports and verify credentials. Immunity passports are not just simple immunization results. It's something that's, it's a new type of document. It's a piece of health verification that would guarantee or disband you from actually being able to enter somewhere or a venue or possibly keep you from coming back to work or possibly keep you out of some sort of area in particular if you do not have the needed antibodies. And according to health experts, immunity passport and immunity testing is very, very um, elementary right now and the research for it isn't solid. So we are concerned about the discussion around immunity passports with verified credentials because of the fact that this is something that's not necessarily standardized within the communities that we have. We don't really have something where immunity passports is a norm for different diseases. So presenting verified credentials doesn't necessarily solve the problem of the immunity passport itself. And immunoprivilege in the U.S. in particular has a very long history of discriminating results. So with that, um, oops, sorry, with that said, with self-sovereign identity and nationalized IDs, this can become a concern when the private sector is using SSI-based technology and thought to kind of deviate away from the privacy recommendations and sort of push their product through 
by using decentralized IDs or some form of verified credential in some way. And we're concerned that states may go and say, well, well, this is a secure technology. This is a very um, well-built engineered technology from a standards body. We're gonna use this in order to push out a nationalized uh, federal ID. And that's not the direction we wanna go. We don't want to have a nationalized ID and database for everyone to adhere to. And we have seen that go wrong in so many ways, especially in places like India, where there was a massive data breach with nationalized ID system and a large amount of discrimination. And also been, it's been implemented in Latin America and that's also come up with a lot of concerns. Um, one of the examples that I have is the Clear Company. Um, you may have seen it in an airport uh, next to TSA PreCheck and it's pretty much privatized TSA PreCheck. And for those of you who don't, may not know what that is, it's just expedited way to get through security in the airport. Um, by going through a certain set of um, background checks and then when you get to the airport you're verified to be able to expedite your way through security because you've met the requirements um, how arbitrary they may be to go through airport security and clear offers TSA pre-check in that way and they're not just a TSA pre-check company, they offer themselves up as a digital identity platform. So they have actually pushed through something called Health Pass, and they're advertising this to employers of uh, what this could look like for them by having like some sort of way of the member identifying themselves through biometrics. And biometrics is something that has been very much so discussed as something that would not necessarily guarantee privacy or security in the context of verified credentials. This starts marrying actually more so to your identity than it would um, if it wasn't in use. So this is an example of something that's been very worrisome when discussing verified credentials with other parties where it's not discussed where there could be some sort of discriminatory practice at play or some sort of um, repercussions that could happen because of the fact that you don't have your health pass and what occurs there. Um, digital first and digital disparities. So we wanna talk about how the fact that, you know, even though smartphone access has been increased, even though um, overall internet access has been increased, it's still very much a huge divide, especially in the United States, of access to broadband internet. Um, even though these specifications talk about how like offline storage could have possibly occur with digital identities, um, things update, things need to change. Um, within your phone system, your operating system, and often, to more often than not, um, people don't carry the latest and greatest with them all the time. So they can be susceptible to certain things um, that may occur as something that's a non-factor for someone who has high-speed internet, um, privilege to be able to access a new phone at the drop of a hat. And since in the United States, we pay the most for um, broadband, but have the slowest speeds among nations with similar development, um, that's something to consider, especially since 23.4 million rural Americans' internet speeds are so low. And with the digital divide, we can't necessarily say that we can get behind digital first identities because of the fact that ac until access is closed, often gap, um, until everyone is receiving high-speed internets and doable um, access to um, new technologies, phones, software updates, et cetera. You can't push through digital first identities or you'll just exacerbate the digital divide that's already there. So we wanna talk about self-sovereign identity and harm reduction because self-sovereign identity as a concept and digital IDs as a concept isn't a bad thing inherently. These things can help in probably certain scenarios, especially low risk scenarios with low correlation of personal identifiable identi information, um, especially with the age 21 scenario that's given a lot. 
um, device fingerprinting still exists. So any application that uses this in particular and asks for access to a DID in particular or uses it should be restricted from using the rest of the phone's ecosystem that could automatically marry and make a high correlation and a unique ID based off the information that's passed through. So we definitely need a structure for that for applications that use this. And with self-sovereign identity, things like verified credentials and community and COVID immunity passports, we don't want to introduce new potential barriers for someone especially if they're marginalized, especially if they're already struggling, especially if they're going through something like we're all going through right now with the pandemic, we don't wanna add more stressors on a person's life by implementing a technology that initially was marketed to be helpful. And continuing that line of thought, digitize SSI as a requirement in situations with central authorities and law enforcement that's always going to have an imbalanced relationship. So when we talk about driver's licenses, when we're talking about any time that we have to go to an authority, um, this defeats the purpose of the overall discussion around having your own ownership around data and having your own ownership that's decentralized and having a portable identification and not have to go through intermediary to actually um, be able to prove who you are or carry who you are with you and if you should have the choice of whether or not you want to prove or carry who you are to law enforcement um, through this means in particular you should have access to be able to minimize contact if needed and if you push through something like digital ids first or mobile identification first that could cause some issues and handing over your phone to law enforcement may not necessarily be needed, especially when you have technologies like NFC where, you know, that's within like a four centimeter range, right? Or Bluetooth technology with the range is a little bit more. Even then, those scenarios can be hostile because what if the officer just asks for your home phone wholesale because their verifier or their reader isn't working or some sort of scenario that could, could occur where they may ask for your phone altogether or they may ask for you to unlock your phone even though potentially with some of these specifications they say that you can actually preset and be able to transmit your digital id without having to unlock your phone um, these are more theoretical and they haven't been really displayed in the wild or um, deployed in different states as something that's been successful yet so we shouldn't assume these scenarios that they're going to be safe just because we implemented a secure way to transmit data. So no matter how well engineered um, some, something is in particular, especially with um, data in transit and data at rest, there's always a risk for a breach. Nothing is unhackable. We all know that. So in particular with data breaches, we've seen that with national ID systems. I have mentioned one in India where they had a data breach and lots of information was leaked everywhere <laughs> um, in terms of what type of information that the citizens had. And that in turn um, has a discussion around whether or not that digital first or a large set database that's centralized somewhere is a good idea. Um, so even though we are discussing decentralized IDs, there's authorities that have mass amounts of data around about us with um, you know driver's licenses etc and having all that information in one place and being able to issue it to a person and so they can have it portable doesn't really necessarily answer that question or help it in any way um, so issuing authorities have notoriously had issues with also updating status in the system um, lots of bureaucracy it could be um, late paperwork it could be delayed paperwork and we should not tie these to same systems with law enforcement. So having digital first with law enforcement may not work out because things like license plates readers can be notoriously outdated to the point where out here in the Bay Area, there was someone pulled over in a car that was allegedly dated as 
stolen when actually it was a rental car that was um, redeemed from that scenario when it was stolen some months prior and given to a, a rental company or they acquired it in some way. But in the police, um, the police saw in the license plate reader that it was a stolen car. So they pulled the people over and it was a very hostile situation and it could have ended really badly if engagement occurred, you know, in any sort of way that was deemed quote unquote threatening. So we don't want to marry these systems together where we have digital first and haven't solved the issue of centralized authorities and their issues with data and data keeping. So consider the following. If you get the Bill Nye reference, cool. But either way, <laughs> with uh, self-sovereign identity, we want to decouple the constant need to verify one's personal identifiable identifiable information to gain state benefits. Um, that could be an idea uh, where um, in many cases, there's been studies of when people try to go get benefits on social security, they actually have to give over a lot of information about themselves, um, bill statements, bank statements, so many things where something like self-sovereign identity could potentially help where you don't have to keep shoveling out mass amounts of data to social services or whatever um, sort of um, entity you may have to prove yourself to in order to gain the proper benefits that you need, um, disability, or could be um, SNAP benefits, or could be some sort of housing benefits, veteran benefits, et cetera. That's a potential piece, piece that could be um, explore SSI that acts as a temporary credential for services and facilities that normally ask for state or city-based identification. I'm thinking about New York City in particular, where they have the NYC ID, where they sort of took care of the need to have a state verified identification to enter and get free museum for a day access or access library services. So I'm thinking that in low risk scenarios like this, where SSI could act as a temporary credential for a service or facility you may not use all the time. You may only need to use it once every other month, or you may only want to go, you know, to the museum this time of year for this exhibit, and you don't necessarily want to get a whole um, permanent credential just to go and enter maybe a temporary credential based off of information that you are already given before. So low risk scenarios, um, online transactions that have um, asked for state IDs. I know in particular that some um, online education platforms, they ask for state identification. They want you to take a picture of the front and the back and send it to them. And it really feels unsafe to do generally when you do something like that. So maybe SSI can stay help here like a bear credential, they discuss what bear credentials are more in depth in the W3C spec of verified credentials. But basically, it's a temporary issued credential, one time single use thing that you can go through and potentially um, not have to actually give over your entire driver's license information just to take a course online. So, reducing that risk, um, reducing the surface area of someone's risk, uh, reducing the amount of data that they have to give over, those are great ideas in, in itself where SSI can possibly come in and actually be a good solution. So in conclusion, um, like I said, we want to reduce the area risk. We don't want to increase the surface area risk with SSI techno solutions. Um, digital identities can be offered, but it should not be enforced. And unless data laws are standardized nationally, we should not trust centralized entities in implementing digitized credentials. And in particular, I'm thinking about like the COVID immunity passports, where the state government is, is in California is looking into, and there was other countries as well, I believe Germany or the UK was looking into immunity passports where they're centralized authorities that want to implement something that generally doesn't have a premise 
and it doesn't have a good premise if if any so unless data laws actually are enacted to protect our privacy on a national level in your country and especially here in the unit in the u.s uh, we don't want to push for something like this where um just because there's the technology that is there and present doesn't necessarily mean that the technology is the solution itself. If the inherent concept causes risk and harm and possible discrimination in the future, you don't want to push an idea through simply because you have all your um, needs met on a level of like, okay, we have strong encryption. Strong encryption doesn't necessarily mean that the concept that I of itself is a good idea. So you want to implement good security standards, but what does that mean when you implement something that a person has to tie to their identity that wasn't there before, and now they have to account for this piece of themselves as well to authorities, to venues, to their job? We want to think about things like that. So I want to conclude this with technology is political. This formed in dynamics influenced by society. So we can't sit there and say that we're going to completely do something or roll a product out saying that, hey, we're using this web body um, standard. We're using this standard. We're using, using this in order to um, accomplish um, certain techno solution that may be pushed through. If you're not thinking about who you're impacting if, or who you may harm or who you're helping, all together at once, you don't want to push through a techno solution um, and you don't want to use the technology itself as a reason to implement a particular idea. You want to implement the idea because you want to actually help the your, your community, help society, and not cause more harm or more ways for someone to account for how someone else can know about who they are online or another data breach because of the fact that there's yet another data set out there that exists that shouldn't have existed in the first place or someone shouldn't have had access to in the first place. Thank you so much for listening to my talk and please download HTTPS Everywhere for Firefox and Chrome and I will be here waiting for your questions. So thank you. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, that was the uh, pre-recorded session. And now we're going to go into Q&A with Alexis. So I, I see some of you have been putting your questions into the Matrix chat. If you haven't and you have questions for Alexis, please head over to session Q&A and uh, type in a question for her there. Um, what we've seen so far is a few people have thanked you, Alexis, for your work with HTTPS everywhere. I think several of us uh, use that tool and, and uh, are very happy to um, see that you were doing that work. The, the other thing that came up was a question that I, I know you answered in the chat. Um, for those that can't see the chat, I'll just, I'll just read it out. Uh, was, do you know, <clears throat> excuse me, if there is any existing precedent for US law enforcement reading NFC data of an arrested person with or without a warrant? And, and so, you know, you indicated that you haven't have seen any legal precedent there, although I think we, we all know that that happens. Um, but certainly that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, one of the other things that you had mentioned in your, your talk was uh, until the digital divide is no more. So is, is that just a very optimistic view, Alexis, or, or uh, uh, did you just not want to let your pessimism show through? <laughs> uh, it's my optimism trying to cover my pessimism as I try to strive forward for a better future digitally. So. Um, if I don't believe in a certain goal, then I'll, then what's the use of all my organizing, right? What's the use of doing these talks? What's the use of educating people if I don't think that there's a possibility one day that the digital divide can close? I do think uh, there's a way of addressing this, especially with broadband in America in particular, and the access to it and getting fiber as a priority. But until then, I do not want to see efforts saying that they want to roll out things digitally and things that are connected to the internet, where the access to internet is highly variable from state to state, county to county, neighborhood to neighborhood. So that's mainly just me trying to establish a baseline more than anything. Awesome. All right. So we have a question on, on what you were talking about. The, the question is, have you looked at the California Real ID standard at all? And do you have any opinions about that? 
So I haven't looked at it in depth. Um, I looked at it from a bird's eye view because the real ID measure um, has hit, you know, pretty much most of the states in some way at some level. So New York's real ID, um, this, this general indication saying that you need a certain amount of, of security credentials on card or indicators on a card to um, suggest that, you know, tampering has not been done to that particular document. And it's been a lot of issues, especially how expensive it can be to switch over to real ID in particular, and also obtaining an, an, an real ID when you already have a driver's license, possibly, or already have an ID and kind of going towards this more federalized standard of being able to travel state to state, like I believe Pennsylvania, uh, had was basically told that if they do not switch over to real ID that US citizens would need passports just to go to another state because that has the security indicators on it that they wanted. So there's been a lot of problems with real, real ID in general and EFF has definitely written on this in particular, but I have not looked in, in depth in California's real ID. Okay, super. And, and so we, we have uh, that Q&A channel open for any other questions, but while we're waiting on that, uh, one question I wanted to ask you you know, you brought up the, the question of people asking in various different transactions for a state ID. Uh, and to what extent has EFF been working uh, around where that is uh, invalid and, and how we can push back on that further? So in particular with law enforcement, we have been doing a lot of work, especially on the border. That's been the most contentious issue in the past couple of years where uh, border security has been brought up as an excuse to overdo sort of the, the amount of investigation that a law enforcement officer will do in one person if they found some sort of probable cause or some sort of way to obtain more information than needed in a particular exchange. So uh, on the border in particular, especially with immigration issues, there was a student that had came into the country um, and they tried to get them to agree to a certain amount of um, information sharing, social media sharing. So um, we've done a lot of work, especially with that as of late, um, making sure that you don't have to unlock your phone for an officer if they ask, or you don't have to give biometric data over, you don't have to put your fingerprint on the phone. And generally we discourage if you go out and you feel like you may be a compromised person or have some sort of threat model that um, indicates that you'd be worried about so that sort of thing with interaction with law enforcement, we generally indicate like do not have biometric systems because of the fact that you can be uh, subject to some sort of pattern of abuse by law enforcement. So we've definitely been doing a lot of work around that and trying to see where that goes with different cases. Great, thank you, Alexis. Uh, next question, you just mentioned being driven to make a positive difference. What advice might you give to other people who also would like to choose projects and passions that will make a positive difference? Hmm. The advice I would give to someone who wants to make a positive change in the world is develop as much empathy as possible for the people around you, for the struggles around you, and try to figure out how you can help uh, more than anything. You don't necessarily have to start an initiative. You don't have to start a project. You can just join one, see the struggles that happen occur there, and you can usually find your place. Um, my place has been in tech and tech activism. And at first I thought I had to go out and march and protest and create signs, but then I realized most of my friends and activist friends that were protesting didn't really have a good secure setup technology wise. And I realized I knew a lot more of my network than most people. So that's where I found my foot. And I started walking in that step. So that's usually how you can find out is how you can help and where, where you can find your place um, usually. So I definitely say you don't have to start anything, just start looking, start seeing where you fit in and where your skills are needed most. Okay. Do you think that the reduced friction of digital ID will lead to more demands for presenting ID in our daily lives? Yes, I've already seen that happen with the specifications that I talked about in the talk, uh, especially with the fact that 
the immunity passport issue in particular, where it's like, okay, we have a specification now that's been published, let's start using it. And people have kind of been using the excuse of, okay, we have more ease and more ways of being safe with this, but then implementing something that is come entirely new precedent um, in America. Immunity passports are the thing. So people asking more and more for a digital identification or a digital sort of uh, validation or reference definitely seems like something that could be a more incurring problem or reoccurring. So I'm definitely watching that. So that's why I did this talk in the first place is to not only shed light on the specifications that have been published and discussing those, but kind of discussing those in the context of where I've seen them in play in action and try to get people to rescope it back to the privacy concerns that were listed in the first place about these particular issues when you're giving over a digitized doc document to someone to a verifier. That has a relationship when you're giving over something, especially to an authority like law and enforcement that has a relationship you have to address that dynamic is not even so I definitely see that coming up more unfortunately in more negative ways than positive absolutely uh, so we have a couple more questions that are veering on a tangent again um, so I'm going to take both of them in turn but if anyone has a last question on on the topic at hand feel free to throw it in the Q&A um, the first one back to the work you're doing with HTTPS everywhere uh, which set of challenges are the worst, technical, political, or social? I'm sorry, can you say that question one more time? Yeah, oh, okay. no. uh, the, the question reads, which set of challenges are the worst, technical, political, social, or, or whatever? Um, I believe the challenges are an intersection of socio-political. So technology itself is not a solution in my opinion. Um, techno solutions are not something I advocate for when there's an existing societal problem, when there's an existing political issue. I would much rather address the political issue first. I would much rather address the societal issue first before I start introducing technology. Okay. You brought up, this is another one on the digital divide. So um, th this question of disparity of internet access and quality of internet between communities. Uh, the questioner asks, is the EFF doing any work to close this divide? Yes, um, so there's several initiatives. I do know uh, we particularly work on broadband access and the definition of what broadband looks like with the FCC. There's a recent post, if you go on the deep links blog on EFF.org, you'll probably see that post in the most recent order. Um, under Ernesto Falcon, he's the author, and he does a lot of work around trying to address the issue with broadband because the FCC actually has a very low bar of what they define as broadband. I think I brought that up in one of my slides with that 25 megabits um, uh, up, up versus down and trying to raise that baseline to where it matches other countries with similar developments. So that's one piece. We do another um, uh, body of work around right to repair. And I also think that has a lot to do with digital divide because if you're not able to go out and actually be able to fix your own devices and get the proper management you need and maintenance and not have to go through one singular proprietary entity just to get your laptop fixed, just to get your machine fixed in any sort of way. I believe that closes the right to, um, to the digital divide in some way, being able to actually have that access to the parts you need in order to maintain machine and cut down on e-waste and not have to buy an entirely new machine just because your RAM is soldered in or your battery soldered in, which makes me very mad when I see ma machines like that. So. Um, I do think there's other pieces of work that EFF does that helps to close the digital divide, but those are the two things and the two um, most active parts of it, I believe, I've seen as of late that we do a lot of work around. Absolutely. So the last question we have actually plays off of that, uh, I think, and um, the, the conversations we've been having, which is, can you summarize, please, our Fourth Amendment rights as they relate to being asked for digital ID, right? So... Uh, and for that matter, having digital ID taken without our permission. That is definitely something that I feel like one of our lawyers will have a better time. That's a short mean, question, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so I feel like with the Fourth Amendment and being able to actually 
summarize along with digital ID doesn't have a lot of legal premise yet. Um, but what I wanna say around that is with your mobile phone in particular, you do not have to go and give over your device to law enforcement without a warrant. You do not have to talk to law enforcement. Um, my first rule is don't talk to law enforcement. St remain silent, utilize that. Um, with the Fourth Amendment in particular, uh, you do not have to give over biometrics data. That's tied to the Fourth Amendment now with legal premise. So in particular, of unlocking your phone with biometrics. Well, th thank you again, Alexis. Great talk, great Q&A. And uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap it there. Um, but we hope everyone will hang around for the next talk. Thank you.